Brother Aubrey, would you open us up in prayer? Amen. Thank you, brother. It's, uh, it was interesting this morning, Brother Gary just touched on uh, getting together all the men for the, uh, the work day that we're going to have next week on Saturday. Uh, he talked about the fellowship, come out for the fellowship, that we should get together as often as uh, possible as a body of believers to fellowship together as well, outside of just sitting in the pews. That kind of aligns nicely with my last uh, Sunday school lesson on fellowship. We're going to continue that theme a bit uh, today, and we're going to talk a little bit about the, the title of this Sunday school lesson. We're going to talk about fellowship, but the title of this Sunday school lesson is, It's Not a Meal Without Love. It's Not a Meal Without Love. I, I have to say that I just, I love fellowshipping with folks when we get together and share a meal. There's a lot of scripture verses as well, I think we all know, that talk about times of fellowship and, and the early church members getting together and there's a talk of food and that type of thing. I know Brother Junior and Masu were over yesterday um, and we enjoyed a time of fellowship over a little lunch and uh, just Prior to that, Miss Kathy, you and Dellis and Janice and I, we got together at a little restaurant, just a little fast food place, and we enjoyed some barbecue together, and there was lots of laughing, lots of laughing, almost got thrown out of the place. We were laughing so much. Great Christian testimony, but it was just laughter, and all, all good things were discussed. So we're going to keep that theme going on, on Christians. This is the church we're talking about. That's you and I here in Bible Baptist Church, and how we are to fellowship one with another. I'll open with just a little story. We're coming up on St. Patrick's Day, and actually Junior will tell you that uh, my wife and I, we like, uh, we like celebrating the Irish side of our family, so we had a little corned beef and cabbage and all the good stuff, some homemade soda bread, Irish soda bread goes along with that. So we had our little, our little celebration yesterday, but with... with uh, uh, Patty's Day coming up soon, as we like to call it up in New York. Um, I'll, I'll open with a little story. Muldoon, Muldoon lived alone in the Irish countryside with only a pet dog for company. One day the dog died, and Muldoon went in to the uh, parish priest, the local Catholic church in Ireland, and asked, Father, me dog is dead. Could you be saying a mass for the poor creature? Father Patrick replied, I'm afraid not. We cannot have services for an animal in this church. But there are some Baptists down the lane, and there's no telling what they will do. So why don't you just go down and ask them? Well, Muldoon said, okay, I'll be doing that, Pastor. Excuse me, priest, father. I'll go right away. Do you think the $5,000 is enough to give to that local pastor to perform the service? Father Patrick immediately exclaimed, Sweet Mary, Mother of Jesus, why didn't you tell me the dog was Catholic? I can make an exception for a Catholic dog. <laughs> so we're going to talk again about fellowship. It's not a meal without love. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. Very, very familiar passage of Scripture. Many of you are very familiar with this. Actually, I think, I think, because we are familiar with this, I think I should read through the whole chapter. I think I'm going to go through verse uh, 1 through 13, and we'll start by focusing on 1 through 5. But let's read the whole chapter together. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Two weeks ago, as I had mentioned, we studied real fellowship within the family of God with other members here, as I was just mentioning. What does it mean to have love, biblical love, for one another, for your brothers and sisters in Christ. People people are longing, longing for acceptance, for love, for friends, for friendship. If they do not find this in the local church when they come to visit here at Bible Baptist, they may not return the next Sunday. How many of us could testify this morning that the reason we became interested in hearing the gospel was because of the love shown to us by a Christian. I know I can say that truthfully. People are not simply won by someone being persuasive, but rather they are attracted. They are drawn to Christ. The Holy Spirit draws them. We must be able to far more communicate by what we are than by what we say. Actions. Actions. Remember how Jesus taught the disciples? He said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Hmm. How many of us take that commandment from Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the one that we proclaim on a daily basis? And how many of us love one another? As I have loved you, love one another. Love God. That's not what he said. That's part of it, and that's good. He said, love one another. Then the Lord says, in this that all men may know that you are my disciples, Hmm. that you have love for one another. Have we lost that magnetic appeal of love within the body of Christ, within the body of believers? Do people, let's say in our neighborhood, outside of the body of believers here at Bible Baptist, do they know you for your love? It's not enough that people know that you're a Christian. They must also know that you're a man or a woman who loves, who cares for others. And now let me turn a little bit and say with that statement, that's to spread the gospel. That's to the unsaved world. Well, did you ever think about it in terms of how folks within Christianity, other Christians, view our love for them? Today, we want to look at the how. The how. This lesson is on involvement, how we get involved, the details of what real fellowship means. 
We're going to dig a little bit into the uh, chapter that we just read. Let's first look at verses uh, 1 through 3, and I'll have some comments on that. The priority of love. It's very familiar ground, I will say that. Yes, we are in a famous passage of Scripture for Christians, speaking directly to Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, is directly speaking to Christians. It's what a slide rule is to an engineer. It's what the alphabet is to a first grade teacher. It's what winning races is to Kyle Busch, Mike Brame's favorite driver. I'm sorry, Mike, I'm just messing with you a little bit. <laughs> Do we really know what these verses are saying to us? There's five conditions to consider. Five conditional clauses, let's say. The though I, the though I, if I. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, that's found in verse 1. Though I have the gift of prophecy, verse 2. Though I have all faith, verse 2. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, verse 3. Though I give my body to be burned, in verse 3 also. That's an impressive list. Now notice what follows each time, each and every time. And have not charity. We all know charity meaning love. And have not charity in verse 1, and have not charity in verse 2, and have not charity in verse 3. Even being burned at the stake without love means nothing. Even being martyred means nothing. Paul's writing here. Perhaps this is the time to tell each of you that we need to stop at this point. I could tell you that when I first studied this lesson, I was under conviction at this point, and I had to pause, and I had to pray for a few minutes because I was deeply under conviction. This word charity, as we know, I keep mentioning, means love, agape love. Love is seeking the highest good for the other person, for that other person. Remember, we're focusing on Christian fellowship. This is wanting what's best for that other person. This is doing what's best for the other person, not for yourself. This kind of love is not basically a love from the emotional side of love. Though it always involves our emotions and feelings, nevertheless, this is a, an, an act. This is a doing kind of love. This love is, is in our mind, prompted by the indwelling Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit res resides within your heart, this type of love should be shown on a daily basis, on a daily basis. Again, focusing on our Christian fellowship. The Spirit of God wants our minds constantly seeking the highest good for those saved people around us, as well as for those unsaved around us. We talk a lot about witnessing, about getting the gospel out. It's the Great Commission. Of course we talk about that a lot. But we shouldn't push aside or play down the necessity of love for one another and fellowship with one another and the importance of that. Let's talk a little bit. We're going to look now at, in verses 4 through 7, the meaning of love. We have a list of 15 characteristics of love here. We'll try to look at the original meanings of these words. Our goal is to know what God wants for us in this area of fellowshipping with one another. It says love is patient. Charity suffereth long. What does that mean? Long-tempered, let's say. The first part of the word means long or far in distance. The second part of the word is themos. That uh, means heat. That's where we get our word thermometer from. Literally, it might read long time before we get heated or irritable. 
makes me think that uh, Janice wanted me to focus on that for a little while while I was studying this. How about a long time before we get heated or irritable? Charity suffereth long. Some of you have little children. I have little grandchildren now. My children are grown. Our children are grown. If you do have little children, then you know this illustration well enough. Little ones have a way of bringing out the impatience that is already within us, sometimes. Fathers make plans. I used to make plans all the time. And then the small children do things to alter my plans. And I'm a man, and I'm focused. And I know I'm going to do this, then we're going to do this, then we're going to do this, then we're coming home, we're going to eat, and then we're going to bed. My plans are laid out before me. My children often altered my plans. I needed to have patience <laughs> to deal with that. I think we all needed to have patience to deal with that. This word, patient, suffereth long, is always associated, always associated with people. There's a sister word called endurance, something you may be familiar with. That is always associated with circumstances, not so much people. This would be a, a situation like if you got a flat tire. Um, this idea of patience with people then reveals our love. That's how people will see us as a loving Christian or not, whether we have patience. I can tell you that if there isn't patience, what does the Bible say? Then there isn't love. Now you can see why I may have had some trouble while I was studying this, because I was reflecting. It was like looking in a mirror at myself. Impatient. Good grief, I said. Impatient with people? Me? Sadly, not just at work with me, but at home quite often. Well, I won't say so often, but certainly at times being impatient. Yep, that can be me. Maybe you. Americans, we're an impatient people. We like fast things, fast food, fast cars. We like everything moving at a, at a very quick pace. Remember, I was just saying when I was a younger man and had young children, I liked to have my day ordered like that, but my day had to stay on that order so I could fix and, and get through the day in a quick way and an efficient way. That's the way my mind used to work. Now I say, Lord, give me patience. But sometimes what I really mean to say is, Lord, give me patience, and I want it right now. It's almost like praying. If we pray, it's almost like praying for interruptions in our day. Sounds strange, right? But that's kind of the thought that I had. Lord, allow me to have a few interruptions in my day so that I could love on some people. If you want to develop patience, you must submit yourself to the schedule of God, not your schedule. Every appointment, every planning detail. When you do this, then you realize that the interruptions actually are most, or, well, I should say, are not interruptions at all, but divine appointments that confirm or conform, I should say, conform us to the one who is love, because as Brother Gary mentioned uh, in his last Sunday school message, we are all conforming. Our goal is to conform, to become that image of Christ as best we can. Amen. Love is kind. So we looked at love as patient. Let's look at love as kind. The word kind means helpful, free from petty criticism. Oof, another one. Loved studying on this. It has the idea of positiveness all the time, being positive. I am not a positive person all the time. I try to be as positive as I can be, but I am certainly not positive all the time. But that's the idea here. It also carries the intention of friendliness. You must always have the intent of being friendly. Not the appearance of being friendly, but we should have the intent all the time of trying to be friendly. This is the same word Jesus used in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, when he said, for my yoke is easy, easy, and my burden is light. The same word was used there. 
This has the meaning of being pleasant. It's a pleasant thing. Jesus is saying that if you put on his yoke, it will not be irritating or encumbering. It will be a pleasant thing to have. In John 8, it contains the story of a woman, you're familiar with it, who was caught in adultery and thrown at the feet of Jesus. Did you ever think possibly, possibly that the Pharisees may have set her up in the first place just to entrap Jesus? As most of you know, I have a law enforcement background. And uh, I actually did have this thought before. Were the Pharisees, were they the ones that set this woman up to trap Jesus? It's just how my mind works. It isn't unlikely, it isn't unlikely, that one of them may have been the man that was with her so that he could accuse her before Jesus and there would be no question. I don't know. Remember Jesus' response, though? It was kind. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's a fantastic response from our Lord. Only God would respond this way to any of us. Most of us, most of us, in this type of situation, we would say, give me my rock. That's a nice rock over there. I think I'll choose this one since we're all going to do it, right? Yeah, that's our human or our humanistic worldview that comes out in us. But that was not Jesus' response. His response was the deepest of love, the deepest of love. Are you, am I, are you kind to others? Is your response to people pleasant? Do you make a genuine effort to have a positive spirit? Or do you, let's say, do people tend to avoid you because you are negative so much of the time, always telling others what's wrong with your spouse? or what's wrong with your kids, or what's wrong with your life. Remember we talked two weeks ago about some Christians are like the porcupine. They're great to be around until you get too close to them, and then all of a sudden they bristle up and you back off from them. That's the porcupine we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Point three, love is not jealous. Love is not envious. It has this... This word has the idea of burning with envy. Jealousy is the inordinate passion to keep what I have, while envy is to want to have what you have. Jealousy wants to keep. Envy wants to have. Here's a little story. This was written some time ago, and I think it's been updated over time. You may have heard it before, but it's titled, Envy Went to Church. Envy went to church this morning. Being legion, he sat in every other pew. And envy fingered wool and silk fabrics, hung price tags on suits and neckties. Envy passed through the parking lot, scrutinizing chrome and paint and fancy wheels. Envy prodded plain Jane wives and bright wives married to milk and potato dullards and kind men married to razor-tongued shrews. Envy thumped at widows and widowers, jabbed and kicked college girls without escorts. Envy lighted invisible fires inside khaki jackets. Envy laughed at the off-brands while raising high the items from what would today be, I don't know, Gap, Abercrombie, or something like that, American Eagle. Envy conferred often this morning with all of his brothers. He liked his scores today, but not enough. Some, you see, some of his intended intended clients had sipped an antidote labeled grace and wore the wonderful flower named love, charity. Envy does, the devil does, Satan does sometimes sit next to us, even Christians and tries his best to ruin our testimony within the body of Christ. 
Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6, contains this phrase, jealousy is cruel as the grave. That's a strong word picture when you think about it. Jealousy as severe, jealousy is as severe as hell, is what is being communicated here. So how, are our, how is our spiritual love life today for others? Are we all demonstrating this kind of love, Christ type of love to our brothers and sisters in Christ, including, including, I will say, the leadership of this church, our pastor? Are we showing our pastor this type of Christian love, the one that the Holy Spirit, that Jesus Christ wants us to have for one another? Are we patient? Are we kind? and without jealousy. It gets kind of convicting when you think about it. It certainly was convicting me. Let's look at number four. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. Verse four says, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. The word vaunt means to play the braggart. One of the early church fathers connected this word to an academic pride or an intellectual pride someone that's got their PhD um, and feels in their mind that they're superior, at least their knowledge is superior to others. That's kind of what we're looking at here. It's true. Someone said it takes us 20 years to get a full education, and it takes us another 20 years to get over it. The higher one climbs on the academic ladder of education, the greater the tendency is to push away those who have not climbed with you or have not kept up your pace. Why can't we just be what we are? Clumps of dust who are formed by God and have God-given capacity to love one another. The words puffed up refer to bellows filled with air, to blow air on a fire. Well, what's the difference? Bragging is what we do, but arrogance is something that we are. You can be arrogant, or you can brag, and your arrogance is shown through your bragging, because that's what we do. Arrogant attitudes will eventually yield those bragging words. It will come out. It festers in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to defer, excuse me, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Hmm. Paul's saying, you act as if you didn't receive what you have. But you didn't get anything. None of us. None of us get anything on our own. It's all a gift of God. Where we are socially in this world, you didn't do that for yourself. There's a reason that God appointed you to be in the place that you're in today. I'm in business. Maybe that gives me an opportunity to share the gospel of Christ with others that are in my field of business. Brother Ken, you work around lots of people, lots of people in your job. Obviously, God wants Ken to be where he's at and where he has Miss Juana to share the love of Christ with other people. But he also, bringing this back to the fellowship, (laughs) I'm going to use Ken. I'm so sorry, brother. I have to use you. It's not in my notes. It's just the Holy Spirit's leading me. But when Ken brings those goodies, have you ever seen visitors light up? Have you ever seen the children? Forget the children. Have you ever seen me go, (laughs) whoo-hoo, today's a good day. To God be the glory. That's right. But that's showing love for one another as well. Not just the visitors. It's shared amongst the brethren as well. So there's love there. Let's keep that in mind. That's kind of the example and the direction we're going in this, this lesson. 
we need to make something very clear at this point. If you're going to have a ministry, and I think that most all of us want to have a ministry, amen? amen? I believe that. Then we must realize that no ministry can exist in the presence of bragging, of pride, and of arrogance. It's simple. Point five, love does not act unbecomely. Verse five says, doth not behave itself unseemly. The word unseemly comes from the word scheme or shape. A chair has a certain shape. It has a scheme to it, an outward form. Love is not on the outward appearance unbecoming. Okay, If you have true love, that should not appear to be unbecoming. It should not look poorly. The best word from our modern language today here for this um, is the word tactless. Love is not without tact. We all may use that word every now and then and say, boy, that person over there, they really have no tact. They're tactless. Okay? Let's take an honest look at ourselves as, as fundamentalists. As a movement, we certainly have turned out a share of tactless, rude, sharp, blunt, Christians, probably even more than the liberals, to be completely honest with you. Oh, me. Oh, me. I hope I didn't hurt anyone's feelings. Or actually, in my notes, it says, I hope I didn't hurt my feelings. I wonder how many people determined to stay in their lost condition simply because of an outward form that lacked love in the life of a Christian that they came into contact with. Wow. Wow. I've heard people say, if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. I've seen a few Christians over the years come in to minister unseemly. They've been sharp, as I mentioned, blunt, rude. Sometimes um, they're tactless with their children, um, maybe even to some Sunday school teachers here, and I know in, in, in another church that I attended for a number of years, um, I heard quite a few stories about parents coming to them, and I would say that uh, they were not very Christ-like when they spoke to their Sunday school teacher. If a Sunday school teacher had been to, heaven forbid, say, little Johnny was acting up today, I just want to make you aware of that. Little Johnny never acts up. It must have been you actually seen that and heard that from Sunday school teachers and churches. Love has a tremendous power to adjust when it comes upon the unexpected. Love does not say the end justifies the means. We all say that one. Since the end is love, then the means should be love and loving. This is so important. Love says the proper thing at the proper time in a loving way. Remember, folks, our lesson is all about fellowship within the body of Christ, fellowship here amongst the body of believers in this church. I've heard people excuse unseemly behavior by saying, oh, that's just the way they are. If this is all that can be said, then it's not much. Too many people blame it on their personalities, their parents, their children. Boy, that's the world today. And, and, but remember, we're talking about Christians. And even the geography. Oh, John acts that way because, you know, he's from the north. We don't act like that down here. <laughs> There's no excuses. There's no excuses. It's not where you're from. It's not how you were raised. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Your Father is in heaven. That's who's raising up you to be more like his son, our savior. So there's no differences. It's a nice idea to try and use some of those as excuses. Don't get me wrong. I may have used an excuse or two in my lifetime in the past as a Christian. Right, Brother Ben? Too many of us are educated beyond our own intelligence. Love does not seek its own. Literally, it says, love does not seek the things of itself, its own interests, its own rights. It doesn't always have to be first. It's not selfish. C.S. Lewis said, 
To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to keep your heart intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safely in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, unpenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is in hell. C.S. Lewis. If you would have biblical fellowship, you must have genuine love and acceptance of other people. Stop excusing your sin. I need to stop excusing my sin. It's just my nature. Here's another good excuse. The Holy Spirit, as I said, resides within us. And the Holy Spirit has changed our old nature. Yeah, there's a flare-up every now and then. We all go through that. But the majority of the time, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just let the Spirit control your life. Stop trying to control it yourself. That's when we get into trouble. Aren't you tired of making a mess of it? I certainly am. Let's tell the Lord that we want to change today the way we respond to others, especially to those of the household of faith. I'm going to close with a little poem. I don't know who wrote it. I just read it and thought it was pretty good. When I got to heaven... When I got to heaven, I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it all, by the lights or its decor, but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp, the thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, the trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. Uncle Bill, who always thought, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus. What's the deal? I would love to hear your take. How'd all these sinners get up here? You must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Please give me a clue. Hush, child, said he. This. They're all in shock. No one thought they'd see you. Amen. And I think that's enough said. Brother Frank, would you close us out in prayer, please?